Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I've had a chance to meet the uh, journalist fellows, and I have to say they're really a lively group uh, asking all kinds of great irreverent questions of the scientists who have been speaking to them, uh, which I think bodes really well for the coverage that's going to emerge from this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's not maybe your typical story that you get. Uh, of course, there will be a lot of science in the talk, but I'm, I'm also going to talk about how science gets converted into findings that we can then use in policy making and in making decisions. And I think it's a really important and somewhat untold story because you oftentimes will get these sorts of uh, coverage. The, a big group like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will release a report that says unequivocally humans are affecting the climate. And then in the story, there'll be something that says, and on the other hand, here's one guy from the University of Chicago that says that's not happening. Right? And so people have a hard time then putting in context, well, how do I compare this IPCC thing to this other guy that just said they're wrong? Right? And so it's really important, I think, that people understand the processes that we use for assessing science, for evaluating it, and then applying it to public policy questions. So that's really what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and as you can see here from this first slide, uh, a lot of the kinds of questions that we focused on traditionally have been, in the, have been in this area of national policy. So I've got the Capitol Dome. Uh, but increasingly, as climate change has accelerated and gotten worse across the country, there are all kinds of additional problems that people are having. Either they're seeing impacts and they have to figure out how to retrofit existing infrastructure so it doesn't suffer these impacts, uh, or they're planning a new bridge or something and they want to make sure that they build it high enough so it's not going to flood. Uh, and as you get to these, you know, these other kinds of management issues, uh, that's where you begin to see real challenges in applying climate science. Um, and in particular, what I'm hoping that you'll come away with is some understanding of this project that I'm currently involved in and why it's important. Uh, as Sunshine mentioned, it's about trying to get more people involved in applying climate science and taking advantage of what we do know. Um, as I'll talk about, I was convened, uh, I'm, I'm now at Columbia University. Uh, my normal affiliation at Maryland is through a Department of Energy lab. Uh, which was not comfortable with me doing the work I'm doing now, so that's why I'm on leave. But we've managed to reconvene this advisory committee, uh, and really it's all about applying what we know to make better decisions, even if the knowledge that we have isn't perfect. Uh, and it's about increasing the role of non-federal scientists in this work. So just as an overview so you can see what's coming, I'm going to give you a little bit of a uh, reflection of 2017. Those of you in the audience who are as old as I am might remember a show called That Was the Year That w or That Was the Week That Was. Uh, I'm going to sort of present it as That Was the Year That Was. Um, talk about this process of putting together scientific assessments and what's that in, what does that look like. Uh, and then thinking about what's next. If we're really working on adaptation and mitigation as the primary responses to climate change, what's, how does assessment have to change? What, what, what are we looking at in terms of the need for science? And then finally, some ideas about how you can help. So, 2017. Um, one thing that's kind of notable about 2017, it's the 30, uh, 41st year in a row where the average annual temperature exceeds the 20th century average. And so you can see these little bars down here that have, uh, have appeared uh, starting in 2017. You have to go back to 1976 to find a year where the global average temperature was below the 20th century average. So no one, let no one tell you that this is a couple of odd years that we're having that are a little bit warm. This is part of a really long-term trend. Uh, 2017 happened to be the third warmest year on record. It was actually the warmest non-El Nino year uh, on, on record, uh, and that six of the last years, warmest years on record, have occurred since 2010. Uh, I think the fellows have had quite a few of these kinds of slides over the week, but this is saying not only that was it warm, but we had a record number of climate disasters. This is a figure from the NOAA 
uh, National Center for Environmental Information, and it just shows the different types of greater than $1 billion weather and climate disasters that occurred during 2017. And this doesn't even include some of the things, uh, some of the uh, damages related to the California fires, which they count in a different way just on their, on their spreadsheets, so they're not sort of si single large events. So this is, uh, you have to go back to 2011 uh, to find a year that had as many billion dollar weather and climate disasters. Uh, and then this is a chart from the same source that just shows if you're not counting just the number of events, but actually looking at the costs of those, uh, it was a record year uh, in terms of 306, more than 306 billion total damages. The previous record in 2005 uh, was about 214 billion. So you can see these things are having major effects on the economy, communities, and, the, and this dollar amount, you know, it says here 300 lives lost, more than that. There's also just tremendous disruption to communities around the country that's not even being represented here. So these are really costly events. They're mounting up. They're having effects on insurance rates. They're having effects on people's, li you know, their, their livelihoods and so forth, health and safety. Uh, and in particular, as I'll talk about, disproportionate effects on many disadvantaged communities that don't have access to things like insurance or some of the other coping mechanisms that we in better off situations can use. So with that as context, 2017 uh, was also a year where uh, the Trump administration decided to disband this Federal Advisory Committee on Climate Science. Uh, and that may seem like an odd juxtaposition to you. It certainly seemed a little odd to us on the committee um, when we thought about it. Uh, and the committee that was disbanded had been put together by the Obama administration, and I think that's one of the reasons why they decided to discontinue it. Uh, and we had a particular charge. It wasn't just to produce another report about climate change. It was to say, how do we use the information in these reports more effectively to help people tape take climate action. And I think that was really the other essential uh, reason that the committee got canceled was that they didn't want people to be using the science to take action because they're trying to deny that the science is real. Uh, and so if you don't believe something's real, why would you want somebody to use it? Uh, interestingly, a few weeks ago, the Washington Post, Post broke a story. Uh, some, uh, one of the interest groups used the Freedom of Information Act to get access to the Department of Commerce um, emails that showed why this was actually killed. Uh, and it had to do with the fact that they thought there wasn't enough industry representation on the panel. Uh, and they, they, they thought that there were too many scientists, I guess. Um, on a science panel, uh, but the, the, uh, they actually even miscounted the number of in industry representatives. They thought we only had one, when in fact we had three, including somebody who was on the board of directors of ExxonMobil, uh, which strikes me as being pretty closely involved in the industry. Uh, anyway, so that was another one of the events of 2017. Uh, and then finally, this is technically 2018, but the build-up to it was 2017. Um, New York State, Columbia, and the, something called the American Meteorological Society uh, came together and they enabled us as a committee to reconvene so we could finish the project that we were working on preparing this report. And I should say that in New York taking this action uh, is not just, you know, we're not a New York State Commission. We don't report into the governor in any way. They're just providing resources on behalf of a larger group of states, the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is about 16 states, um, largely uh, northeastern or then, you know, west, west coast. Um, and these are states where there's uh, pretty much democratic governors who have committed the states to continue the actions the U.S. said it would take when Obama got us into the Paris Accord. So it was really a, du a direct response to pulling out of the Paris Agreement uh, that the Climate Alliance was set up. And New York's <coughs> actions here are really on behalf of that larger coalition of states, not just New York State. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're continuing our work. We've added some members. Uh, and there's some, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Being a federal advisory committee gives your results, the results of your reports, a certain amount of um, weight and heft, in particular federal agencies, have to kind of listen to them. But there are all kinds of advantages to not being a federal advisory committee, including that it's a lot easier to talk to people. Uh, because when you're on a federal advisory committee, there's somebody called the designated federal official 
who's always at your shoulder whenever you have a conversation with someone who's not in the federal government, kind of monitoring what information is passed back, back and forth. It makes it a little hard to do your work. Anyway, so that's 2017. That was the year that was. Um, one, one thing I just want to mention about 2017 is that paradoxically in all of this, the Trump administration is still allowing a major report process to continue. So that by law, the country prepares, the, the administration every four years prepares a major report on climate change. It's called the National Climate Assessment. I'll be talking about it. And they have not shut that process down. Uh, and some, some of the folks from URI, I think, in fact, are involved in helping to prepare that report. So it's just one of these ironies. While they shut down the committee that's about trying to use the science in the report, they're allowing the report itself to go through. So assessments. I've, t I've used this word assessments, and I want to just talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, assessments are kinds of, they're, they're major reports. You've heard of things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the group that shared the Nobel Peace Prize uh, with Al Gore in 2007. Uh, there's something called the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and there are assessments for other issues like biodiversity loss or ozone depletion. And what these really are are processes in which these groups of people like this, this is just a group of the scientists who are involved as lead authors in one of these processes, will sort through the thousands of articles that are relevant to a particular topic and figure out what they actually say. Uh, we had a discussion this morning in the, with a journalist, uh, um, uh, a colleague from Rutgers was presenting a, a really great presentation on climate science and said that one of her articles had been attacked by some of her colleagues because it got a lot of play in the press and they didn't feel all the kinks had yet been worked out of it. These kinds of assessment processes are really the opportunity for the science community to come together, look at all this and say what's the best information that we can glean from these sorts of studies that we see. And so you will find them looking at thousands of different articles and reports. It's a very time consuming process. Um, they take multiple years. I, I, uh, as uh, Sunshine mentioned, I was the director of the technical support group for one of these reports done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I can tell you it's a lot of work, uh, but fascinating. You meet great scientists, you meet great people. Uh, and the, you know, the way the process works essentially is that there's, uh, governments agree to an outline. Here's what we want to know. And the scientists go off and start to prepare drafts. They'll put together a first draft that gets reviewed just by experts. They'll put together a second revised draft that then gets reviewed by governments, non-governmental organizations, anybody that really wants to. Uh, and it takes a long time. Um, and the scientists are volunteering their time for this. You'll hear, that you'll hear a lot of uh, stories that I think are not accurate that say people, they do this because they get paid. Most scientists who do this do not get paid. It's considered to be a community service, and so they do it on top of their teaching and other, other research. Um, the thing about these processes that are limiting about them is that the public doesn't really have access to it. Uh, it's very, you know, kind of technical. It's hard for people to follow. And I think that that's one of the things that sometimes makes the reports themselves seem a little bit remote and difficult uh, to follow. So these reports uh, get organized around different topics, and I'm just going to kind of present it this way. They kind of address three different sets of questions. The first is the you know, what's changing? Is anything different in the environment? That's the working group one, the physical science basis. And that's where you'll get things that look at, um, you know, changes in temperature, changes in precipitation patterns, changes in ocean currents. How do all of these things come together and affect uh, and make longer droughts or heat waves or what have you? So it's really the what ch what's changing. The second type is the um, impacts and adaptation kinds of studies where they say, all right, something's changing huh, you know, what's the deal? Uh, so what? Does it really matter? And so that's where you'll get studies of the impacts on agriculture or water resources uh, or health impacts where people are trying to put together all the evidence about those kinds of issues. And then the third sort of studies or, or assessments really come in and look at the now what. Uh, and in particular in IPCC, that's focused mostly on what's called mitigation. It's a little bit confusing because that word can mean something else in other fields. But in the climate science field, mitigation is about reducing emissions 
through things like energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy, um, uh, using uh, forestry or changes in agricultural practice, things that would help slow down the rate of climate change. And so it's mitigating the rate of climate change. So those are you know, the kinds of questions that we get to in these assessments. And we do have a national assessment, uh, as I mentioned, that's mandated every four years that looks at all of these questions but focused specifically on the United States. Uh, and I'll show a couple of results from that. So just to give you a better sense of this, I'm going to give you a few of what I think of as my greatest hits, uh, things that I really think are just uh, incredibly important uh, that have come out of these kinds of assessment processes. So this first one is from the, the so what, I mean, the, or the what's changing set of questions, and that's really the establishment that humans are changing the climate. Uh, and the first uh, report from the IPCC series, the 1995 report, came up with this very important conclusion, very moderately stated, the balance of evidence suggests a discern discernible human influence on climate change. And the, the amount of work that went into this, huge amounts of statistical analysis, looking at multiple lines of inquiry and data, uh, borehole readings, uh, different kinds of temperature records, ocean uh, heat content, ocean surface temperature, all these different sorts of records. And what you can do is establish kind of a fingerprint of change, because not everything is causing warming. We've heard some of the particles that are emitted into the atmosphere co cause cooling, and if you can start to pick up these different patterns of warming and cooling, you can really attribute change to human activity very solidly. In 2001, the next of these big reports, they come out roughly every six years, uh, the scientists had a stronger conclusion. There is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. So you can see that a lot of careful work and the still very modulated, some would say understated conclusion uh, is presented. And then the 2007 report, most of the observed increase in globally average temperatures since 1950s is very likely, in other words, a greater than 90% chance that's due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So there it is, the uh, smoking gun, um, and it took a long time, multiple cycles of this arduous process for the scientific community uh, to reach that conclusion. So this is a result from the second set of studies, the working group two ones on impacts. And this is not using model results. This is the so what looking at impacts that have been observed around the world. And you have no idea how long it takes to put together a simple graphic like this, but this is representing dozens of different studies from around the globe that have been calibrated together uh, to show uh, the impacts on, first is the sort of uh, physical climate systems, so these would be things like changes in hydrology or water resources, changes in snowpack, uh, things like that, in biological resources in the green, so either terrestrial ecosystems or fisheries, and then the red is human systems. And these little bars represent the level of confidence in the studies that the scientists have said, how confident are we that human activity are causing what we're seeing? So it takes, you can imagine, it takes a huge amount of time to put together something like this. It's really something that you can do best in one of these big assessment processes where you bring together multiple authors of different kinds of studies. Um, and then the third set, uh, again, I think the fellows may have seen some of this analysis. This is that last set. This is the what do we do about it. Um, and what this chart is showing is the concentrations over here of different greenhouse gases. And I guess I'll use the bathtub analogy, which isn't perfect. But if you imagine a bathtub as it fills up, it's getting to higher and higher levels. That's the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And what's causing that buildup is what's coming out of the spigot. In the case of the bathtub, the water. In the case of climate, it's the emissions from our tailpipes, from uh, cutting down forests, all land use and land cover change, industry. So it's all these uh, different factors that are related to population, economic uh, growth or affluence, and technology. And so this kind of work is really analyzing what sorts of assumptions you make about population growth, how many people, how wealthy are we, 
are we consuming in a green or a not green fashion, um, and what sort of technologies are we using that give you the difference between these high scenarios up here where you might get something like four to almost five degrees centigrade of global average surface temperature, or down here, which is where much of the policy debate is about, can we keep climate change below two degrees C and avoid the worst impacts? So the important thing about this chart is that it, if you look at this is again these, there's about 900 emission scenarios that were analyzed uh, from different models to put this together. The ones that get you down to this low level have certain characteristics. They have lower population growth. They have, generally speaking, green economies, and they use a lot of very high-tech uh, energy uh, solutions. Uh, if you look, this is the zero line for emissions. A lot of these scenarios that are down here at the two degree C level, you know, roughly 2080 or so, they get below zero net emissions to the atmosphere. Think about that. Every year we're adding huge amounts to the atmosphere, and by 2070, 2080, we have to be taking out more than we put in. So you might ask, how do you do that? Well, we can use these kinds of models to assess things like bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. Right? It's a not, not yet widely used technology, but you're, you're growing, you're using plants which suck carbon out of the atmosphere to, pr to produce bioenergy, and then you're sequestering the carbon in the soils or elsewhere. So it's a very, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be hard to get the sort of technology Im uh, implemented, but we think that, you know, we've been criticized. I was one of the authors of the study that put this basic framework of the RCPs together, these different scenarios, and people said, why are you including that bottom one? It's not possible for us to get to. And we said we're including it because we may need to get to it and we need to have the opportunity to study how we can get to it. So this isn't a prediction, this is a, d a device that we can use to look at what are the ways of getting to a particular target. So, and this is sort of towards the end of my, um, so, you know, the kind of assessment um, overview, but this is the, just gives you a flavor of the kind of information that comes out of the U.S. National Climate Assessment. So this is a diagram that summarizes a lot of the results of uh, one of the earlier assessment reports. Uh, so you can see we have, you know, roughly eight, eight big regions of the country. And what the report does is it highlights in these different regions what some of the impacts might be. So for Northwest, you get declining snowpack, which has, you know, effects on the availability of uh, water in the summer. Um, you know, other, uh, Southeast, you get scarce water supplies. Uh, as a result of uh, increasingly uh, serious droughts. Uh, in the Northeast, one of the things you really see is the increased intensity of precipitation and impacts resulting from that. But it's really at this kind of high level of aggregation that you could imagine and understand why does that makes it difficult for somebody here to understand how do I change the bridge I'm designing so that it better reflects the possibility of flooding that we know is there. Right, so this is what we're trying to go to, and I'm now going to kind of pivot and talk a little bit about why, um, it, you know, why we want to change the National Climate Assessment and add this support for people who are trying to take action. Um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm just going to mention this and I can come back to it in the question and A. This is a slide that I also was very involved in. The fellows evidently had quite a discussion earlier in the week about uncertainty. Uh, and this is an area that I worked on with a very dear colleague, now uh, deceased, Steve Schneider, um, where we're trying to provide confidence levels that tell people from very high confidence to very low confidence, how much do we believe in the findings that we're presenting? Is this something that we're sure of, or is this something that's still speculative scientifically? And it's very important for assessments to do this well because they're presenting the information that's available at a moment in time. You know, usually in science, you might try to work to a particular confidence level. If we're telling people, here's what we know now, we just have to tell them what's the implication for how well we think we know something. So, um, in, you know, I think as a result of all of these assessments, people have become convinced that there is a problem and that there's something that we have to do about it. 
Uh, and you know, the process that I'm now involved in is picking up on uh, reviews from the National Academy of Sciences and other groups of these national assessments that say that they do have to do a better job of supporting climate solutions. Um, and that's really what I'm going to focus on is, is the, the, the use of science to support adaptation. So uh, a colleague uh, 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 and a, uh, a tremendous leader in this field, John Holdren, who was the president's science advisor, used to give a, a talk and would say that there are three basic options for addressing climate change. And the first, which is you know, oftentimes historically in this debate been the one that everybody talks about is, as I say, mitigation. It's reducing the amount of climate change by changing our energy system and our consumption of energy patterns. Uh, and that's where the bulk of the work has been. Um, there's a second area of work called adaptation, and this is really making adjustments to existing systems, retrofitting them so that they can better withstand stronger storms and you know, longer droughts, things that are going to be coming with climate change, or when you build a new system, anticipating what climate conditions are going to be like so that you can build it right from the beginning and it doesn't have the impacts that you're worried about. And this, of course, is a photo of the Thames barrier, uh, which was, uh, you know, prevents central London from flooding very frequently. It was put in in about, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, and at the, at the time it was designed, they, I think they expected it would go, it would be deployed, you know, a couple of, you know, every two or three years is what the design specs were for. It's now being used six or seven times a year. Uh, and it's, you know, they're very worried about what's going to happen post-2030, which was its design life and how they're going to handle it. Um, and I'll just say that all adaptation options, you know, they, you know there's, there, many of them also have some downsides. So in this case, it's a behavioral one um, where the f folks have, you know, uh, property developers and so forth have become so confident of this particular system that they're now building in flood zones in, in London. And setting themselves up, we think, for some pretty disastrous losses. So it's not just us that's sometimes crazy about these things. Um, and so to the extent that we don't do these first two, John would say we're going to see a lot of suffering in the world. And I'll just say that the impacts of climate change at some level, they don't know, you know, bounds of uh, creed and color and so forth, at least in theory, but in point of fact, they do. It's communities oftentimes who have least resources to adapt, who don't have, who are already suffering uh, environmental injustice because a lot of the coal burning plants, for example, are in their neighborhood or they're the ones who are actually digging the coal, which as much as some people want to bring those jobs back, they weren't great jobs to begin with. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that we believe needs to be evaluated and that there's real concern that a lot of communities don't have access to science. Uh, and that they need better access, and that's one of the other things that we need to do with the national assessment. So, what are people trying to do, and what does it say about the kinds of science that's necessary? So this is just a uh, chart, and I apologize for the large number of words on the slide, but this is, a, this is really, f from this spring, we've had this, as I mentioned, ability to talk better, talk more easily with end users of climate science. And these are some of the things that they talk about doing, and you can just see different illustrations of them, but building weather-ready infrastructure, uh, managing uh, community development to better prepare for increased risk of, of uh, wildfire, really crucial issue in California. Um, a lot of communities are experiencing higher rates of flooding, and so they need to figure out how to reduce that uh, so that they can maintain economic viability. Um, you know, a lot of private firms are worried about where do they build distribution hubs uh, as they see more uh, an increase uh, in weather-related damages and interruption of transportation systems um, and so forth. So these are the kinds of challenges or goals that communities are facing and that we see we need to see we have to take these regional and sectoral studies and translate them in ways that then make it possible for people to know better what to do. And the, the good thing is, is that a lot of this is happening. 
So individual university scientists are working with people in their own communities and they're coming up with ways of kind of collaborating on climate science. So I'm going to give just a couple of examples of this. One is from Nags Head, North Carolina, um, and this is courtesy of Jess Whitehead, who's one of the members of this advisory committee that's reconvened. Um, and what they're, you know, they've dev devised an open uh, participatory process that involves partnerships between the town and a lot of the North Carolina Sea Grant uh, universities or, or, or researchers. Uh, and what they're really worrying about is trying to prioritize across a set of adaptation options, some of which involve hard structures, some of which involve more of a, w you know, a, a, w a green or wetlands approach, um, which of these would be best in helping to reduce rates of erosion and protect uh, the town. Um, they've been able to get science inputs both from national sources and then with local application of those that have helped them evaluate different beach nourishment strategies as well as interactions between water resources and the water table and the septic fields uh, which are affected by increased precipitation and sea level rise. Uh, in particular, they've done a lot of vulnerability mapping and tipping point investigations. Uh, and they are moving forward with a plan uh, that they now feel is pretty scientifically based in spite of the fact that the state legislature is one of, is one of these states where they've decided they could legislate not to consider climate change uh, and sea level rise. Uh, or a second example, uh, closer to home here in Brookline, uh, is a project that was conceived through something called the Thriving Earth Exchange, which is part of one of the scientific societies, and an investigator, uh, Arup Ganguly, who's a colleague at Northeastern. Uh, and this is responding to a community concern that there's going to be a growing number of extreme heat days and populations are going to be vulnerable to that and what should we do about it. So they did a project that used both climate science data, public health data, and census block data to try to look at what some of the um, strategies might be. Uh, and they you know, identified factors like uh, race, poverty, age that would be associated with vulnerability and then mapped the distance of these populations to cooling centers and came up with some recommendations about how the town could effectively locate cooling centers and reduce the vulnerability of the populations they were concerned with. And, you know, this, it's a really careful and detailed analysis because it includes not just kind of climate change generally, but also looks at things like heat islands, the local conditions uh, related to land use and where buildings are and what types of buildings and impervious pavement and so forth that make heat, uh, heat events worse. So, you might ask, if all of this is already happening, what's the role of the National Climate Assessment? Um, you know, particularly, how can a national program help provide so much local information? Even, even during the Obama administration, we were never going to be able to serve everybody's needs. It wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. And so, what we're suggesting from our committee is that we need to change how we think about these assessments and what we study with them. So, instead of just studying the science, we also now need to study and come up with good practices for how the science is used. Uh, and so you might think of it kind of as taking, you know, there's going to be dozens of cities around the country where people are concerned about heat effects and vulnerable populations, and they are working with their own universities to try to do some of this work. But what we're not yet doing is figuring out what is a good practice in all of this? Are people using the right climate science? There are a lot of different models and sources of data. Are they, using, are they effectively using decision analysis to help relate this to things that people care about, like dollars and cents? And we, we need to be using the assessment to study that and come up with good practices for how people can do it so it can be duplicated around the country. Uh, I didn't include a map that shows where people are doing adaptation planning it's literally just on the coasts and the upper Midwest. The rest of the country, you won't see any dots. And so how are we going to start to get some of this information out to places like that or communities uh, that lack access to it? <coughs> so what we're recommending from our advisory committee and our report will be coming out this fall uh, is that, number one, that we make the assessment an inclusive process, that it really address some of these equity and environmental justice concerns. Um, that we need to go beyond ringing the alarm bell and saying there's a problem to evaluating, as I said, the way uh, how we apply this information. 
um, and that you know it's focusing on what people are trying to do. So think back to that horribly dense slide with all those adaptation actions. We need to organize it not around sectors or regions, but around those kinds of problems. So it's a really different character of report um, and that it synthesizes across different case studies. Um, and that there's a lot of things that are missing, the practitioners will tell us, uh, and particularly including things related to uh, financial metrics uh, and helping them use this information in things that they already have permission to do, like capital improvement plans. How do you use some of this information so that when you have a capital improvement plan, you've made sure it's a climate smart capital improvement plan? Um, we think that part of the way to do this is to expand the role of civil society. Some of the groups that are already involved need to be more involved in the assessment. And that there's a lot of cutting edge technology which we haven't tapped, which we can do a better job of using. So things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, citizen science uh, methods that take advantage of social media and smartphones, uh, and geographical information systems. So I'm not going to get into the details of any of this except to say one give one example, um, which is that we are promoting something called the use of a community of practice. Uh, and you might think of something like the Society of uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. Right, so they have a technical group that's already starting to look at how to use climate science in improving the design of buildings and other civil, uh, uh, civil structures. Uh, and they're developing some information, but right now it's just closed up within that little group. And they themselves, when you talk to them, say, we don't know who in the climate science community is best for us to talk to and where should we be getting the information we need. So we can use this process to start to expand that conversation and make it a more effective one. And we think that you know, that sort of thing that's already happening doesn't have to be run by the federal government. It can, be, it can build on the things that are already happening, and that's what we, when we say a better role for civil society, we really just want to take advantage of things that are already happening. So um, I won't say much uh, other than, again, to emphasize that we think that the climate change issue is one where climate and environmental justice are really central. Um, the current energy system itself, I think, negatively impacts a lot of low-income communities. Um, and minority communities, and we need to use the sustained assessment process because many of these groups don't have access otherwise to do things like focus on how climate change and policy itself affect low-income communities, um, issues related to climate forced migration both within the country and internationally, um, equity and how disaster resili resilience and recovery funds are spent. Um, I think there's some real questions there that I hope the journalists will get into. Uh, and then what, what would a just energy transition look like? I mean, I think one of the things that's exciting to many activists as they look at a new renewable-based energy system is that it's not centralized and it's not high capital that one set of people own the profits from, but it's you know rooftop solar and wind and other things that are more distributed and that individual citizens or small corporations can actually put into place and benefit from. And if you do it right, it also has increased resiliency because you don't have single point failures, for example, that can become the focus of terrorism. Uh, so there are a lot of things, but you know, how do you bring that about? They're really you know, interesting questions. So just in you know, kind of wrapping up, um, you know, if you think about the, the where is all this going, the group that I'm chairing is going to complete its work in the fall of 2018. Um, we're working towards an announcement uh, related to uh, uh, a big summit that the state of California is convening along with others, a climate action summit that's going to be held in September. Uh, and we think that there's attractiveness to the organizers of that because this fits in with what they're trying to do, right? Their, their point of that summit is to sh say, the country is still meeting its Paris commitments. It's going to have all kinds of examples in five areas about the, how that's the case. And we'd like to be able to help them add and say, and the country is meeting its commitments and starting to get prepared for climate change without the federal government, even though the federal government is not uh, in favor of this. Um, and the, you know, this better connection with the states in particular, I think, gives us some hope that this will have legs. So, you know, I'm always asked, and I think it's always important to talk about, you know, people want to know what can they do, what's the message of hope. And so I don't have, I'm not going to give you my pet 
ideas about energy efficiency and what you can do. But I think you all, you know, you all belong to different types of groups that have lists like this that are kind of keyed to your own interests and capabilities. And I would go back and look at some of those lists from some of the other organizations and see what kinds of lifestyle type actions you can take. Um, we have a survey up here, it's very easy to find, tinyurl.com climate assessment survey. Um, you could provide some direct feedback to the committee as we're working on this report. It wouldn't take any more than five minutes. Uh, I'm happy to share the link again, but just remember climate-assessment-survey. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of those of you who are uh, in, in, in interested in philanthropy and able to do that. Um, we need some startup support. We're running on fumes. Um, and there's also support that's really needed for a lot of the science advocacy groups. Um, I think many of us are worried that data is under threat, that some of the long-term data sets that have been collected carefully over the years uh, could be taken down by the administration. And in particular, there's a group, the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, uh, that's working to try to monitor those sites and protect them. Uh, and so that's another thing that if you really care about this issue and you want to get involved, that you, could, that you could do. So anyway, and just in sum, you know, I think that the climate assessment reports have done a good job of conveying the risks uh, and that a sustained process, the kind of thing that we're talking about in our committee, can do a better job of providing re resources that support solutions. Um, you know, and that we're proposing this new process that increases the role of civil society and doesn't wait for the federal government to do this, uh, and that we're trying to launch this consortium of organizations to bring it about. And, you know, essentially what we're saying is as, as important as these studies are, there's sort of a mirage effect that, oh, the <coughs> next study is going to give us the answer. That's the one. And we're, you know, kind of lumbering along, waiting for the next study. Uh, and as, it, as Tom Toll says down here, hint on findings, too late. Um, I'll just say that this cartoon is, I first saw it in 2003 uh, when I was running the program for the Bush administration. So this is, a, this is not a new sentiment. It really is time for us to get beyond this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this really informative talk. Uh, my question yesterday to the speaker would have been, our decisions on building fossil fuel infrastructure that contributes to climate change as opposed to how climate change affects the decisions we make. And this is a huge issue in Rhode Island right now. Two big projects, one of which will be decided by FERC and one of which is being decided at the federal, at the state level, would totally put us at odds with bringing down carbon content in the atmosphere. And you know how not only we're working as hard as we can to get information to the decision makers, but how do we get the decision makers to listen to that information? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that's an age-old problem, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I'm the right person to give you any insight, I don't, uh, other than to say that I think that we have to, we have to be organized politically. You know, you really, there's no substitute for political pressure, and, uh, you know, the, the, in this kind of unusual role that I've had, where I'm not a decision maker, but I'm providing information, you know, particularly through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Process, there are a lot of stories about, you can see, governments or interest groups trying to influence things. So in one of my reports, uh, I got, you know, we get comments from all over the world. The government send them in, and one government from the Persian Gulf sent us their comments, and this was old, I mean, I'm dated enough that this was still being done by fax machines. Um, and uh, the guy forgot to take the cover sheet off. All right, so his, his, he had his cover sheet to me, dear Dr. Moss, here's the comments of Kuwait on the report, and then I turned the page and the next thing was, dear Mr. Ambassador, here are your report, here are your comments for the IPCC report, and it was from a fossil fuel lobby. 
right? So it's not necessarily the case that these processes, even though we give people the information, that there's a level playing field uh, and that you can count on things that are right being done on the basis just of the facts. So it just to me says that there's got to be constant political organizing and pressure and there's no way around it. I wish I had, maybe somebody else has a better answer. seems to me that I've never heard of your organization and I certainly haven't seen your report. How can we get the report that's about to come out, we as citizens, number one, and number two, is it, po is it possible for us to ask you and your organization to also send copies of that report to people like our governor or our other political people who should have act, you know, should be doing something in our states. Is that in the cards or not? Yeah, I mean, we're, so we do have a website, but we're, you know, there's, right now there's three of us. There's me and two others who are the only people who are <laughs> running the show. I mean, we have 20 committee members who we're working with and then some additional volunteers. Um, but that is, we're working with a group called Climate Nexus, which is a climate communications organization. So they're helping us plan a strategy. But I'd love to get more ideas about what we should do. You know, we have this little website, as I mentioned. But the hope is that we can disseminate this widely. Um, I think because of its origins, the fact that the, you know, there was a lot of coverage when the Trump administration killed the committee. There was a lot of um, coverage when um, Cuomo and others announced that they were reconvening it. Uh, I think there is going to be interest. And our real hope is that we can get the governor of California to make it part of the final announcements at the summit in California. I don't know if we'll get to that, but even failing that, um, we have to have a strategy. Um, and so we're working actively on it. And I'll just say, I think it's more effective if somebody like you sends the report, you know, say we can get it to you, which we will, because um, you, you can sign up on the website for updates and things. It's gonna be more effective if you send it to the governor than if we do. You know, and that goes to all of you. If you, you know, if, if people hear about something, we've read this, we think it makes sense, where are we on this issue? Um, I think that's more powerful than if we, who are seen as biased because we wrote the thing, uh, send it to them. No. No. Yeah, no, we don't. Um, I, and we need it. That's why we're sort of appealing for support. But the, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, this is one of these unintended consequences for the Trump administration. If they hadn't shut this thing down, we would have delivered this report as a federal advisory committee and the federal agency would have opened the drawer and put the report in the drawer and closed the drawer and that would be the end of it. But he sort of created a moment that we're trying to take advantage of because we think it's so important to move forward in, in being, you know, using science to be better prepared as a nation. Um, but not, I mean, certainly not me. I'm, you know, I'm a bit of an introvert if you ask my family. Uh, so I'm not, this, this is all new for me. I'm not, I'm not an organizer, so I, you know, we need all the help we can get. Which do you think is most important, getting this information to the industries or the public, the general public, and how do you keep them, that momentum going once the information's out there? Uh, I think both are crucial. Um, I think that because of what we talked about earlier with, you know, action coming from public pressure, that it has to keep getting out to the public. And I think that the climate science community is only just starting to learn how to convey information effectively to the public. Um, and part of it, as was talked about this morning, is knowing where people are starting from, not just coming and telling them here's the result, but starting with what's the problem and where, what do you view it. I mean, I've had direct uh, experience, say, on military bases, uh, where we've done some projects to try to help the military base reduce flooding, for example. This was an a Air Force base 
uh, that was experiencing a lot of flooding um, because it's along the coast, and they, it was affecting their schedules and their training um, routines and things, and so they wanted to address it. Uh, and so long as we didn't talk about it as human-caused climate change, they were on board, right? So it's finding the right, the right uh, voice for talking about some of this. And there's good research and communication um, as a discipline that helps people understand how to do this. So I think that's something that we need to work on. But clearly from my presentation, you can also see that people are working on presenting this information to cities and states, but you know, as they're making investments of public money or private companies, and that also has to improve. So I don't think we can do just one. I think we have to do both. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Uh, to go to your, uh, you're just talking about the military bases. My understanding is at least some parts of the military have fully embraced the fact that climate change is happening and they're thinking about it both in terms of future engagements as well as where they, where they actually are sited. And is there anything we can learn from that particular group, which is a, a large population, uh, what they've done, how they are dealing with it in terms of adaptation, uh, either from the good or the bad. What can we pull away from that particular group of people? Uh, I do think there are interesting lessons, but it's such a unique institution in our country because it's so hierarchical. Um, and, um, you know, people follow orders down the chain. And so if they're told to do something, they'll do it. Uh, and so a lot of what's happened was during the Obama administration, there were high level orders from the top down that you will do this and it affected both energy use. There was a lot of purchasing and requirements and so forth for green energy and green technologies, but also you will start to do vulnerability assessments so that we understand how our bases and our infrastructure and the military is the biggest public holder of infrastructure in the country. Um, how all of that's going to be affected, right? The Government Accountability Office has demanded some of that. So it flows down, but I'll tell you, you know, having done a lot of this work at the level of individual installations, um, there's a lot of resentment of it. You know, people will say, oh, this is just the Al Gore stuff, don't want anything to do with it. Uh, but they have to, and so they'll do it, they'll do the minimum to be able to check the box. So I don't think it's the panacea that we might hope. Um, I do think that there's a lot of, uh, the, you know, General Mattis, I think, is, um, you know, thinking about this in the right way. He's not backing down from it. He's not saying climate change. He's not taking a different line than the Obama administration took, which is that climate change is a threat multiplier, uh, and that there is still a lot of high-level attention, but it's not, you know, I, I wish I could say it, it provided the answer. I don't think it does. My last question. I've been contacted to Obama. His program last week on Sunday night actually did a segment on the environment. And you know who he is? Oh, yeah, I know who he and is. I don't get to watch the I wish I got to watch the show more often. <laughs> yes, I'd well, be a happier guy. Right, exactly. Um, he's already on board with your thoughts and you know, to some extent you'd be preaching to the choir because the people who watch him already believe what you talk about, but it's a thought. I'll, I'll take it under advisement. I will, I will try to watch the show more often. 